exposing the corruption in government and in major multinational corporations. We're telling you the things that they don't want you to know that will make your life better. Hey, everyone. Kevin Trudeau here. Happy Wednesday. Welcome to the Kevin Trudeau Show. Everything they don't want you to know about. Now, I'm in the tuxedo, not for you. I have a formal event as soon as I finish the show, so I am in my formal attire, as uh, Frank Sinatra would say, a dinner jacket. So I'll be uh, doing that. Hope everybody had a great week. We have a great show. I mean, I got, I'm talking about Bitcoin today. Uh, oh, the globalist agenda I got. I'm talking about some non-controversial topics, immigration around the world and how it affects you and your life. I got a couple of movie recommendations, a book recommendation, testosterone, uh, how to have better sex life, uh, a whole bunch, a whole bunch of stuff. So uh, stay tuned. We get a lot, we have a great show. Uh, last weekend, I went to a comedy club. Now, for some of you who don't know this, back in 1979, 80, 81, I did stand up comedy in Boston at a place called the Ding Ho Constant Comedy. And back then, the star of the, of the kind of the king of Boston comedy was Lenny Clark, a good friend of mine. Uh, he did the Lenny Clark show for a while. He was on the John Larroquette show. But he did stand-up comedy back then. And there were other comics that I met during those years. Stephen Wright, who is uh, still uh, doing comedy today. Kevin Meany, who passed away recently. Uh, uh, Dennis Leary, a whole bunch of spectacular comics. Mike McDonald, Don Gavin. I mean, the list goes on. A lot of them you, you may not know, but back then, they, was, they were the stars of the show. And when we did stand-up comedy, we were very funny. We actually wrote jokes. And there was a couple guys who didn't have very much talent. And the way that they wanted to be funny was to curse they, they had to say the F word over and over again. That was the way they, they were going to be funny. Or they had to make some sexual joke talking about a woman or male's genitalia. Or they had to talk about some bathroom type of humor. Okay. So I went to this comedy club. Now, by the way, you, you don't need to swear to get your point across. And that's why on this show, we don't, we don't swear. I mean, you watch other podcasts, you watch other shows on YouTube. Everyone, it's like completely normal to say F this, F that, F this, F that. Look, I'm not judging anyone. I'm just saying we don't need to do it here. And over the years, there have been comedians who never swore that were hilarious. If you go back, some of you don't even know, to the silent film era. Of course, you couldn't swear because it was silent film, but there was Charlie Chaplin. And then if you go through all the list of people, and I made this list of people, some of you don't even recognize the names, Dean Martin and Jerry Lewis. Watch some of those movies. Hysterical. Jerry Lewis was hysterical, never swore. The Smothers Brothers, Rowan and Martin, the, St the Three Stooges, the Marx Brothers, Foster Brooks. He's on the Dean Martin Celebrity Roast. If you watch the Dean Martin Celebrity Roast, nobody's swearing, nobody's cursing, nobody's using any bathroom locker room type humor talking about a, a woman or a man's genitalia or anything like that. Milton Berle. And some of you don't even know these names. Like, boy, he's, he's telling everybody how old he is, right? Uh, Foster Brooks, I mentioned him. George Burns and Gracie. It was a George and Gracie show. Jack Benny, Bob Hope, Jonathan Winters, Buddy Hackett. I got a, I got a list here. Don Wrinkles, Phyllis Diller, Carol Burnett. Remember the Carol Burnett show? Lucille Ball, Laurel and Hardy. Now, in modern times, you get Steve Martin. In modern times, in the 70s, right? So you get Steve Martin. He never had to swear. Hysterical. He used to fill auditoriums with 50,000 people, and he did a complete routine, had people in stitches, no cursing, no bathroom humor. Benny Hill on TV from England. Mr. Bean. Monty Python. And then... Bill Cosby, if you ever watched the Bill Cosby uh, live, I saw Bill Cosby live, his comedy routine didn't have one curse word, one swear in the entire routine. It was clean as a whistle, G-rated, hysterical. Jerry Seinfeld, Robin Williams, Jay Leno, David Letterman, they were all stand-up comics, and they were spectacular because they had talent. So I went to this comedy club, 
and there was one, two, three, four comics. The main guy was a big podcast superstar, some guy who's a, a podcaster. I never, I never heard of him before. All four comedians, they, have must, they must have used the F word at least a thousand times collectively between them. That's all they said. F this, F that, F this, F that. Is this normal? Transgender jokes, women's genitalia, man's, men's genitalia. Now look, I'm not judging. Oh, he's a prude. I don't particularly think it's funny in rare instances, but it's not about judging. It's about talking about the decline of society, not just in America, but around the world, because we have people watching here in countries all around the world. And the reason why I say this is this show is about awakening you to what's happening, to take you out of your trance. And if you come out of your trance, if you actually awaken to what's happening around you, then you will be empowered. You'll no longer be hypnotized and controlled by the powers that be. You will be at cause over your environment. You'll be happier. You'll be more at peace. You'll have more serenity. You'll have a, a, a feeling of fulfillment that you're following your purpose and that you control your destiny. You'll feel powerful. Your personal power will be unleashed and your life and every aspect will get better when you see what's happening around you without trying to change it. It doesn't matter what happens around you. You don't have to change the external situations. You don't have to change the government. You don't have to change the religion. You don't have to change the media. You don't have to change the laws. You don't have to change any of that. All you have to do is improve yourself and then your life will dramatically change. It's you coming out that creates your reality. So think about that. Think about the decline of what's happening in not just America, but around the world. And if you can see it for what it is as a way for the powers that be to make you more, now pay attention, it's all about making you a snyop somebody who is susceptible to the negative influence of other people, someone that's suggestible. Now, listen, I know this. Some of you have read my books, Natural Cures, and the other one, More Natural Cures Revealed, where I talked about a little bit about my background and the organizations I was a part of and some of the things that I was doing for the powers that be. I know this better than anyone. Controlling you, making you susceptible to the influence of them I talked about this as the image makers, the secret science of images that I, I've talked about in some of my training programs. I expose what's happening and exactly what they're doing. They do it in the media. They do it in music. They do it in movies. They do it in TV. They do it in every aspect. And the whole idea is to get somebody suggestible and then give them suggestions. And now you control them. This is how the organization I was a part of called the Brotherhood controlled all the politicians. We just made them very suggestible. And once we make them suggestible, now we can just throw suggestions in and control them. Folks, you're being controlled. You're being controlled. But no dramas. Remember, this is a show where no matter how you feel right now, at the end of the show, you're going to feel better because you're going to be empowered. I'm going to give you the solutions of how to improve the quality of your life. So we got, we, got, we got a lot coming up today. Now, Bitcoin. For those of you who were members of the Kevin Trudeau fan club, I did a video to partners in the Kevin Trudeau fan club. And if you're not a partner, you should be. About, what was it, about 14, 15, 16 months ago, something like that, 18 months ago when I did the uh, Bitcoin presentation. About 18 months ago, I think Bitcoin was at $1,200 or something like that. And I said, I was just talking to friends of mine who are in Dubai with multi-billionaires, people that one of the guys was the, one of the inventors of Bitcoin, if you will, or one of the first people involved in Bitcoin. These were people that all the billionaires, whether it's you name the names, they go to for the information. I was on a phone with this guy. He was at the meeting and I was talking to all these folks and I got the inside scoop and I shared it with my partners and I said, look, 
Bitcoin's having a halving event coming up this year. It's coming up. I says, and Bitcoin's going to skyrocket. So I would encourage, I went, went into great detail about uh, my suggestion, something to consider, think about. I'm not a financial planner. I'm not giving you financial advice, but I'm saying this is what I'm doing. This is what I recommend. This is what other people are doing. Think about it. I said, put some money into Bitcoin. And if you want to trade, get involved with my friend's organization because he's an expert on trading alternative coins where the upside's bigger. But Bitcoin's going to do very, very well. Well, Bitcoin, what is it? Anybody know what was that today? It was like 60,000 or something. I think it hit 60,000 today from 13,000. And if you paid attention, if you listened to me, you would have made a fortune. And for those of you who got involved with my buddy and his organization, and uh, we'll send out that, that details to fan club partners again this week. If you're not a partner, sign up and become a partner. We'll send you the information. People who followed his advice, because he gives a recommendation of what alternative coin to buy and whatnot, if they followed his advice over the, over the last 18 months, they would have made 10, 20 times on their money, 30 times, 40 times, 50 times, depending on what, the advice that they followed. And there are so many people that, that got involved and then bailed out right away because successful people do the right things long enough consistently. And unsuccessful people have no patience. They bail out. They're not persistent and consistent. And for many of you, and I know you, because you sent me an email, I said, well, I got involved, but I don't know. I'm having doubts. And I said, well, that's fine. Ask for a refund. Got, they got a refund. And guess what? They missed the boat on making 10, 20, 30, 40 times on their money. And some of them even 100 times on their money over the last 18 months. So all I'm saying is you don't have to listen to me. You don't have to do what I tell you to do or recommend to you for you to do. Do your own thing. I know you're smarter than me, right? I know you're real smart. You're smart. You're, you're smarter than me. Do, do what you want to do. What, what do I know? Let me tell you the difference between rich people. Now, by the way, I'm wearing, I'm, I'm wearing this hat. I am now the world's best mentor. So as the world's best mentor, I'm going to tell you, there's a difference between wealthy people and poor people. And actually, I was just reading an article this morning that was talking about there's three classes of people in America now. There's no middle class anymore. And this went on to talk about the trends over the last 50 years. It was very detailed. You're never going to hear about it because it goes against the narrative that the politicians want you to believe, and you fall for it because you're dumb. Okay, you're not dumb. You're, you've been trained to be suggestible. Snap out of the trance. That's why you're watching this show. Thank God you're lucky. You're at the right place, and you're at the, at the right place at the right time because you've been made suggestible and they want you to think you're doing well. There are three classes of people, not just in America, but this is what's happening all around the world. It doesn't make a difference where you're watching the show from. The first class is what's called the ultra wealthy. And this is the 0.01%, 0.01% of people on the planet. They're the ultra wealthy. The next class are the wealthy. You can call them the rich. The spread between the rich and the ultra-wealthy was about 7%. Now it's 22%. Actually, it's up to 25%. The last time it was this high in America was during uh, the 1920s, right before the Great Depression. Ding, 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 ding. Think about that. That spread's getting bigger. The rich are pissed off as well as everybody else because they're saying, Hey, the ultra-rich basically are controlling everything. They're just going further and further. You know, we're, we're doing okay, but we have no chance of becoming the ultra-rich. The spread between the rich and the ultra-rich is now bigger than ever. And then there's everybody else. There ain't no middle class. Everybody else falls into this category of poor and maybe not so poor. And someone says, wait a minute. In America, we don't have, uh, you know, we have a great standard of living. I'm in Germany, I have a great standard of living. I'm, I'm in Spain, I have a great standard of living. I'm in England, I have a great standard of living. I'm in Australia, I have a great standard of living. 
Maybe you're watching and you're from India and you're going, well, we don't have that great of a standard of living. Or you're in Brazil or Guatemala or Mexico and you go, yeah, we, we don't. But other countries have a much better standard of living. That's true. But if you look at the countries such as America, Canada, Germany, Spain, France, we'll call them the first world countries where we're supposed to have this great standard of living. Has our standard of living and quality of life actually improved over the last 50 years? And the answer is no, it hasn't. And this, now, if you pay attention, your life will become magical. If you stay in a trance, you won't even know how bad your life is. Well, I guess which is not a bad, bad thing. I mean, at the end of the day, if you don't know how bad things are, that's not too bad. Ignorance is bliss, right? So if you don't know, that's all right. But let me tell you, around the world, some of you live in bad conditions and you look at America or Canada or Germany as a, a haven. It's like a, a great standard of living. But let's, let me show you how you've been tricked, how you've been deceived and misled. When America did have the highest standard of living and quality of life, in the world for the majority of its people. It does not today, by the way. For those of you who are watching around the world, don't be uh, uh, trying to get to America. It's not what you think. It does not have anymore the highest standard of living in the world. There are many countries and many places around the world that have a much higher quality of life and standard of living than America. Switzerland, as an example, Dubai, Abu Dhabi, uh, Bahrain, actually many of the Middle Eastern countries, their standard of living and quality of life, there's no crime, everybody makes huge money, everybody has a nice beautiful house and their infrastructure is great, Singapore, there are many places. And of course there's many places that have a lower standard of living. But let's talk about America just as an example, and whatever country you're from, you can apply this. When we had the higher standard of living in the world, we had a husband and a wife, and they had three kids. That was the average. Husband, wife, three kids. Number one, the husband worked a job, and he worked from 9 to 5, Monday through Friday. He had nights off, and he had weekends off. And his average commute time to work was 15 minutes. So let's just stop right there. In terms of a quality of life, you have a job, your commute is 15 minutes to and from work, you work 9 to 5, you work Monday through Friday, and you had four to six weeks vacation a year. Hold on. Your wife didn't work. There was one paycheck coming into the house. Hold on. You had two cars. You had an above ground swimming pool in the backyard. And the house that you lived in has never been lived in before because you purchased a plot of land and you had a house built to your specifications and you moved into the brand new house, and the car you drove was a brand new car, and you had enough money from one person working, just nine to five, one person working, there was enough money for a brand new house, two cars, you didn't need anybody else working in the house, four to six weeks vacation, and the cars were brand new, you didn't buy used cars, and, your wife would go out and buy new clothes every month or two. You would buy new suits and ties and shirts. You would buy good quality, nice clothes, nice dress shoes. You went to the movies. You went to the theater. You went to people's homes for dinner. You went to the ball game. You could actually go to a baseball game or a football game and buy a ticket with your family and buy some some. Uh, popcorn and peanuts and a Coke and a hot dog because it didn't cost you $18 for a hot dog. I went to the baseball game last summer down here in Chicago Cubs. I said, I'll take a bottle of water. Guy goes, that's $8.50. I go, 
I could buy this for like a dollar anyplace else. And he says, not in the park, you can't. I go, this is criminal. You're thieves, you're criminals. A hot dog shouldn't cost $18. They're criminals, they're thieves. So it's wiping out all my cash. So back when we had a higher quality of life and higher standard of living, think about that. And at the end of the month, the family took 20% of their income and put it into savings for a rainy day and investments for their retirement. So let's just stop right there. Right now, you, that, that, that can't happen. If you're a husband and a wife, or if you have a partner and you have three kids, you need two people working full time and you barely make ends meet. You live in an apartment or you buy a house that's a used old house because you can't afford a new house. You buy a used car because you can't afford a new car. Or, oh, back then, by the way, you, don't, you guys didn't even know this. Back then, do you know when people traded in their brand new car that they just bought? Any idea? Any idea? No, again, I get death mutes over here. They're, they're just looking at me like, oh. Every year, every year, they had enough money from one person's income in the family, husband and wife, three kids. They still had enough money to go buy a brand new car. And then every year, my mother and father, every year traded in that new car. Every year they traded that car in for a brand new car. Today, when you buy a car, if you do buy a new one, you finance it for six years, which is the dumbest thing in the world. You're, been, you're in a trance. You've been suckered. Rich people don't do that. Poor, stupid people do. Oh, I'm stepping on toes. I'm calling people poor and stupid. What do I want to call, what do I want to call you? Brilliant? Geniuses, smart. Look, you're uneducated. All it means is you just don't know. I'm trying to take you out of your trance. If you don't want to come out of your trance, if you want to stay in your trance, shut the show off. The show's for winners. It's for people who want to come out of the trance and learn the truth and at the end, feel better than when you did in the beginning. So the quality of, I mean, today, you know what the big advertising campaign is? Just read it this morning. Kellogg's is promoting. Times are tough. People are struggling. Dinner should be cereal. It's cheap. Dinner. Family of four or five. Hey, everybody. We're going to have a beautiful dinner tonight. We're going to have frosty flakes. We're going to have some fruit, big bowl of fruit loops. Life is good. We, ha we live in a great country. We have a great standard of living. We have a great quality of life. Shut up and eat your fruit, fruit Loops. But I had the Fruit Loops for breakfast. Shut up and eat your Fruit Loops. And like it. It's a great country we live in. Great quality of life. That's what the politicians keep telling us. Everything's getting better. What's wrong with you? What's wrong with your Fruit Loops? Oh, you want Frosty Flakes? Eat the Frosty Flakes. Oh. There's something else. Back then, when life was good, nobody had any debt. There was no credit cards. Nobody used a credit card to buy a refrigerator. They paid cash for the refrigerator. They had no debt. The only debt they had was car for a year. They had a car loan, a one-year car loan, and they had a 15-year mortgage. Ooh, time out, time out, time out. Kevin, you must have made an error. You mean a 30-year mortgage. No, children. No, little Johnny, no. They had a 15-year mortgage because it was stupid for anyone to mortgage a house for 30 years because the amount of interest you pay is idiotic. You are a slave and you're in debt for most of your adult life. What stupid person would do that? Oh, everybody today. Because you have been put into a trance You've been suckered into believing that this is the way it should be. This is how you're being made a slave. You have credit card debt, you have a 30-year mortgage, and you have a six-year car loan. Shame on you. Okay, I, I'm calming down. Not shame on you. You're uneducated. You, that's why you're watching this show. 
So what do wealthy people do? Wealthy people understand the axiom. And you've heard the phrase a million times, but you don't even remember it. If I say finish the phrase, the, the phrase is live below, live below. Some of you look at me and you're like, huh? The phrase that we grew up on was live below your means. It actually was morphed to live within your means which means if you're making $5,000 a month, don't spend more than $5,000 a month. Live within your means. But wealthy people understand the original axiom or the original quote, which is live below your means. Wealthy people understand that they start with the amount of money they're earning. If it's $5,000 a month, take home after taxes and after insurance and all that stuff. If that's how much they have to spend, they take 20% off the top and that goes away for a rainy day in investments. That means they have $4,000 to spend, and they can't spend a penny more than that. That's axiom number one. Number two, they don't get any long-term debt, so they don't get a 30-year mortgage. They get a 15-year mortgage, and they purchase a house that they can afford within their, below their means, so they can live below their means. They don't finance a car for six years. They finance it for one year, two at the maximum. And if they can't afford the fancy car, they have to get something cheaper. But this is to show you that people aren't making as much money today as they used to. Because if you look at the prices of stuff versus what you're earning, you're virtually going to live, if you follow this, this methodology or this formula, you're going to be living what appears to be lower, lower class. Guess what? Because you are. The majority of people in America now, there's no middle class. You're lo not lower middle class, lower class. Uh, right above the poverty line. Because that's the formula you have to follow. If you start going into debt, you are basically screwing yourself for your whole life. You're becoming a slave. It's like all these idiots who say, yes, I want to go to college. Please, please give me a loan. Please, please. Okay, I'll give you a loan for your college education. Now, do you promise to pay the loan back? Yes, I promise. I promise. Okay, do you promise to pay the interest when you get you know, a job that you, do you promise that you will pay the loan back? I promise. Okay, sign this contract. Remember, this is a contract. You are promising. You're begging me for the money because you want to go to college and get a degree. And you are promising me, promise on a Bible. You're making an oath that you are going to pay it back. Yes, yes, yes. Just give me the money so I can go to college and drink beer and smoke pot and not do anything and have fun. Please give me the money. Okay. The person signs a contract. Six years later, when they get their degree, because it takes them six years because they've been smoking dope and drinking booze all the, the entire time, so it takes them six years to get the degree. Then they come out and get a job, and they realize, wait a minute, I don't have any money to pay this loan back. And then they go, loan forgiveness. Loan forgiveness. Excuse me. I have, a, I have you on videotape going, please give me the money. I'll sign the contract. I promise I'll pay it back. Really? So today, we don't have the standard of living and quality of life that we used to have. Now, someone says, how is this supposed to help me by you sharing? Because now you're coming out of the trance. The first part about coming out of the trance is actually understanding and having full comprehension of what is. You're not deluded. You're not delusional. Most people are delusional. You're walking around in a trance delusional. It's like, it's like the guy who's wearing a 4X shirt. He's 5 foot 11. He weighs 280 pounds. And he says, I'm, I'm big boned and I'm a little husky. No, no. You're five foot 11, you weigh 280 pounds, you're not big boned, and you're not a little husky. You are morbidly obese, and you are delusional, thinking that you are normal and just a little husky. You are not, you are morbidly obese. You have to snap out of the trance, face reality. You understand? 
It's like the anorexic. I had, I had a friend of mine and she was anorexic and she was skinny as a rail. And she would look into, she put on a bikini. It's like, how can you even go to the beach? You're, you're like skin and bone. She goes, well, I need, a, need to lose a few pounds. She's delusional. She was virtually a skeleton, but delusional. So it goes both ways. But delusion is delusion. You're not facing reality. And the reality is, in America, Canada, Germany, for all around the world, the quality of life and standard of living are declining. Oh, and let's talk about the infrastructure. Once upon a time in America, we built brand new bridges. We built brand new tunnels for cars and trains. We had brand new railroad tracks. We had brand new public transportation. We had brand new electrical systems, brand new water pipes. We had brand new roads. We had brand new everything. So our standard of life and quality of life and standard of living was better than anybody else because everything was brand new. When you drove down the road, it was, man, like you were on, on glass. It was perfectly perfect. No potholes, no boom, 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 boom. The road was brand new, made with concrete. First class concrete, not asphalt, concrete. And not this much concrete, that much concrete so that it wouldn't crack and it wouldn't develop potholes. We had the cleanest water because we had brand new water filtration systems and brand new pipes and sewage. Everything was perfect. Well, now America's infrastructure is 150 years old. There are pipes that were put in in the 1800s. You see what happens? All around the, the, the country, they're testing water. It's like, well, the water's poison. Yeah, because the pipes haven't been improved. And you know why they haven't been improved? Because our government has no money. And you know why? Because America, Canada, and so forth, we are declining. They can't afford it. Well, how could they afford it back then? They built everything back then. We can't afford bridges. Well, how did they build the bridges to start off with? They had the money then, and they didn't even have income tax. There was no income tax. But magically, they had the cash to build bridges, tunnels, now we can't even repair them because there's no money and there's income tax. Back then there was no income tax. You know, I, drive, I drive into the studio. I'm here in the Chicagoland area. They know it snows, they know it gets cold, so they build a road. They build it so it lasts like three days and immediately there's potholes. I drive in, it's like driving on the surface of the moon. I mean, there's holes everywhere. I'm weaving in and out like, you know, like, a, like I'm in a ping pong machine. You know, it's like, oh, I'm afraid if I hit one of these, I'm gonna break an axle. Oh yeah, we live in a great, and it's not just America, it's all over the world. Oh, look at our beautiful airports. I mean, it smells like piss all over the airport. Beautiful, go into a public bathroom and, and, and throw up. Ah. But then go to a country like Dubai. Look at their airport, Singapore, look at their airport. Look at first class, world class cities and countries around the world. And if you do a comparison, you will throw up, but you are in a trance. Now, there are many countries that say, hey, even though you're making it sound like America and Canada, Germany, France, and all these other countries aren't very good, Kevin, you, you should come to where I live. You know, I live in Iran, I live, I live in Yemen, I live in uh, uh, Guatemala. Well, I've been to Guatemala. I know it's tough down there. I, I, I live in India. I know I've been, I, I know it's tough. And so many of these countries are trying to get to where we are today. But you know why this is happening? And this is what I have to explain. There's, you've heard of the globalist agenda, right? You've heard of the globalist agenda. And one of the, if, you, if, if I were to ask you, please define the globalist agenda. Hold on. See, this here says world's greatest mentor. I'm going to change this. I am now talking to you as former insider. Because I know this. Former insider. I don't know about this. I know this firsthand. There is an agenda. The Brotherhood is the main secret society that controls Skull and Bones, Bohemian Grove, 
and secret societies around the world, which then control governments and companies and businesses around the world via the Bilderberg Group, which I've been to. And people always talk about the Bilderberg Group. They talk about Bohemian Grove. You know, they talk about Area 51. They talk about it. They think they know about it. Look, I was, you know, when I was there, I didn't see you guys there. I mean, I was, so I'm not giving you something that's theory or that I know about or what I read about and I'm just repeating. I'm giving you firsthand, firsthand data and information. I'll give you an example. Right across the street from the Four Seasons Hotel in London is a building, used to be owned by the Rothschilds. Right now it's a secret society clubhouse. It just looks like a beautiful old mansion or something. It's huge. I mean, it's enormous. It's enormous. It's like a whole city block. It's enormous. And I was at the Four Seasons Hotel. I went, went there years ago. I was told, go to the Four Seasons Hotel. We'll contact you and set up a meeting. So I get a call in my suite. This is before cell phones. I'll date myself here. I'm at the Four Seasons. I said, yeah. They said, and they told me, this is the, when you check in. So they had organized a particular suite for me when I checked in, which... When you look out the window, you can see the the Rothschild man, the old Rothschild mansion, which is now a secret society private club. So they said, look out your window, and you see the gray uh, building next to you? Yeah, uh, just go down there. If you notice yeah, there's a door, there's nobody there, yeah, just knock on the door. Okay, so I went down, and it's just gorgeous. But there's there's no signage, there's no logos, there's no nothing. It's just the, the street number. There's no person there, nothing. I knock on the door. Door opens instantly as if somebody was waiting, dressed in a tuxedo. Mr. Trudeau, we're expecting you. And I walk in and I go into a private room and they tell me, uh, by the way, this room is where they signed the Panama Canal Treaty. So I'm just telling you kind of the, the ambiance of the place. And this is where I was discussing with, Henry Kissinger was there, in a small, small meeting, there was about eight of us, about the agenda, the globalist agenda, of where this is going. So, and if you come out of the trance and you understand this, your life can be empowered because you will then learn that you have the power to change your destiny. You are not at the whim of the privileged elite class and the politicians and the big corporations. You see, for those of you who, who are watching people on YouTube or listening to all these people who are always saying, they, they're no good, they're doing this, they're trying to control you, blah, 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 blah. It's not empowering you. It may seem like they're trying to, you know, reveal what goes on behind the curtain, but they're not giving you the solution to the fact that all these things can have zero impact on you if you choose. Being at cause of your environment really means that what's inside you affects everything else around you and creates your life. Instead of having whatever life presents affect you and affect how you feel, your motivation, your inspiration, how you feel about yourself, whether you're happy or depressed, whether you make money, whether you don't make money, whether you uh, get fat or whatever, you can be at cause and create the perfect life for you regardless of what's going on in the environment. It's like my good friend Ed Foreman told me one time, he was a two-time U.S. congressman, motivational speaker, he was on 60 Minutes, one of my closest friends, speak, he used to speak at all my events, he passed away. And he was sharing the story, I think it was during the Carter administration or something, when there was a massive uh, 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 a recession going on in the United States. And he said, he said, I remember sitting down with my accountant. My accountant was giving me the, uh, the yearly updates. And he says, well, Mr. Foreman, your uh, sand and gravel and concrete business had a record profit year last year. Your restaurant business, he had several dozen restaurants, also had a record profit last year. Your personal development business had an increase of 20% over the previous year in sales and profits. He says, Mr. Foreman, I don't understand this. You're doing better than you ever have in all of your businesses. How can you explain that when we're in the middle of a recession? And Ed said, oh, real simple. 
I know we're in a recession. I just chose not to participate. Ed was at cause over his environment. You can be too. So the, the globalist agenda basically says, and by the way, some of you think that the globalist agenda are evil people. And you can have an argument. We can discuss whether they're evil or not. But if, you, if you're thinking they're evil people and there's good people, then that's the world of duality. And, you know, one person's freedom fighter is another person's terrorists. It all depends on who wins the war and how you look at it. Some of you think American patriots formed our country. American patriots. They were patriots. Really? They're not e they weren't evil. Kevin, what are you talking about? They were patriots. They were patriots. They were amazing men that we should emulate. Oh, you mean being a traitor is someone you should emulate, being a traitor. What do you mean, Kevin? Well, all these people were citizens of the king. They had pledged their allegiance to the king. And they then became traitors to the king. Remember, America was British colonies that pledged allegiance to the king. And these American patriots were the wealthiest people in America. And people think that, oh, the Boston Tea Party was about throwing tea because of the tax that was imposed by the British. No, that's not the reason why. The tax that was imposed was lower than anyone else in the British Empire was paying. The reason it was thrown, it was organized by a guy named John Hancock. Because John Hancock was the biggest bootlegger of illegal tea in America. And now Britain, Britain, Britain was bringing in tea. And that was going to kill his business. This had nothing to do with starting a new country or a tea tax. Some people don't know the history. I mean, believe me. America won, so therefore the history is written in a certain way. But you can look at that. But the point is, evil, not evil, whatever. But here's what the globalist agenda is. And you may wonder if this is true, but this is it. Number one. And here's the first evil, evil globalist agenda line. This is what the globalists want. And you're going, to be, you're, going to get, you're going to throw up when you hear this. This is what they want. Number one, they want to improve the quality of life and standard of living for all the people in third world countries around the world. They want to eliminate poverty. Wait a minute, Kevin. I thought they were evil people. That sounds like a pretty good idea. But in order to do that, they have to decrease the standard of living and quality, quality of life to everybody living in first world countries. So if you take poverty, third world countries, and first world country standard of living, you lower this one and raise this one. Now you have a class of people that is not middle class, it's below middle class, but they're in a trance and they think their life is perfect. But you're all slaves because you have 30-year mortgages, six-year car loans, and you're maxed out all your credit cards. And you have to work two jobs, husband and wife, to go to work just barely to make ends meet, and you have no savings. That's perfect, absolutely perfect. And they also want people who aren't in that category to be on government assistance. So therefore, they look to the government as their source of supply. They want the government to be the source of everything. It's working out pretty well. Because right now, for example, in America, we just passed, I think, about eight, nine, eight or nine or even 10 years ago. I think it was 10 years ago. It's the first time in our history where less than 50% of people that should be paying taxes are actually paying taxes. So we have this very small percentage of people actually paying income taxes to the government, and they're supporting 60% of the people. That means it's, it's over. For, for, it just can't be reversed. This is one of the reasons why we, they want all these people to come in, because then they can get on the dole. We call it the dole in the UK. They can get on government assistance. And this is why, by the way, this is why the words 
that the government uses to describe you has changed. Once upon a time, it used to be, we're here to protect the citizens of our country. We're here to do what's right for the citizens of our country. We represent the citizens of our country. Used to be citizens. Well, right now America has about 50 million people who are not citizens. They're illegally in our country and it's growing. So then they got rid of citizens because they knew they, being the privileged elite class and politicians, that there were going to be a lot of people in the country that were not citizens. So they said, we don't want to alienate them. So we won't use the word citizen anymore. That's why you never hear the Federal Trade Commission, the Food and Drug Administration, the EPA, we're here to protect the uh, citizens of America. Never hear that anymore. It, then it changed, and it changed to taxpayer. We're here to protect the American taxpayer. We're here to protect the Canadian taxpayer. We're here to protect, protect the taxpayers of this country. So if you didn't pay tax, they weren't there to protect you. So this was to, this was to hypnotize you and put into your mind that you had to be a taxpayer. But then the problem is, because of all the government subsidy programs and all the illegal operations going on under the table when people are just moving cash around and not even filing stuff on their tax return. Less and less people became taxpayers, so they had to get rid of that. So then they came up with the term that's used today around the world. We're here to protect the American consumer. We're here to protect the Canadian consumer. We're here to protect the consumers of the world. So what if you don't consume anything? Oh, everybody consumes, consumes. That's the only thing that's important. If you are a consumer, a purchaser of product, if you are a consumer, then you have some value. If you're not a consumer, you have no value. Getting a little bit out of control. Which brings us to a very non-controversial topic around the world, and that is immigration. We don't use the word immigration anymore in America. I'm not sure what they do in other countries. The word is now migrant. It's not immigrant. It's migrant. Now, come out of the trance. Come out of the trance. You got the mainstream media screaming, what's wrong with people immigrating to this country? There are, this is a country built on immigrants if we're talking about America. Well, that's good. Then why do you make it so hard for somebody to immigrate legally? Mr. Mainstream Media, Mr. Politician. Why is it easy to cross the border illegally, but it's almost impossible to come in legally? Why does America not want the person who has a college education, who has plenty of money, who's going to come to this country and start a business, or come to this country and has a six-figure job waiting for them? They're college educated. They have plenty of money. They're going to be a great value in addition to our society. They want to learn English. They want to become an American they, or whatever country they're immigrating to. They want to blend into this culture. They're proud, but it takes them two, three years, if at all, and you make them go through hoops of flame. But why is it, is it so, so desirous to have somebody come across the border from Mexico who comes from mainland China or Nicaragua who doesn't speak a word of English, who has, doesn't have two nickels to rub together, who has no education, no skills, why do we want that person? And why do we say, come, come on in, come on in, no problem. You don't need to fill out any paperwork. You, don't have, you can break the law. You don't have to do that. Just come on in. But if the person comes across the Canadian border from Canada, or they're coming in to JFK from Germany, and they go, I have a master's degree and a PhD, and I have a job as a professor, no, we don't want you. 
As a matter of fact, the fact that you said that you're going to come here and work, we're deporting you, and now you can't come into America for five years. It makes no sense. We got 30 to 50 million illegal people in the United States. It's all over the world. It's happening. There's a. I'll talk about the reason why this is, but I just want to give you two two little tricks on this. Number one, the majority of people come into this country illegally. They work here, and they send the money that they earn or percentage back to their poor country. They're pulling it out of whether it's America, they're pulling if if it's England out of England, whatever country they're immigrating to, Italy. They're pulling it out and sending it back to. Nigeria, Somalia, Mexico, Guatemala, uh, Nicaragua, China, wherever. Because they came from poverty, and that American dollar is worth huge amounts of money over there. That's not good for the uh, American citizens. It's not good for anybody who's living here. It's not good for our infrastructure or our government because all the money's leaving. It's just not good, which is why we have no cash. One, one of the reasons we have no cash. And there's a lot of other negative reasons for that as well. Why is illegal immigration so prevalent all over the world? Because all over the world, there are people who life, whose life sucks. They live in poverty. They live in horrible conditions. They live with horrible governments. And they think, if I can leave this country and I can go to Italy, or if I can leave this country and go to Germany, if I can leave this country and go to Norway or Sweden or the UK or America, once I get there, they will take care of me. The government will give me a credit card. They'll give me $2,000 a month. They'll give me a cell phone. They'll give me food. They'll give me a place to live. And then I can work, get a job, start earning my, my, my pay, send money back to my family, and then they'll illegally come, and then we can have a better life. For most people, that's their plan. And you have to you know, pour your heart out to those folks. There's a lot of criminals that are coming in, too, just for the idea of saying, hey, this is a great new market for us to operate a crime ring. And we know that too. Okay. But the majority of people coming in, the illegal migrants, the illegal people coming into these countries, that's what they're looking for. Why didn't countries or like America have a problem with illegal immigration back in the day? Why didn't it cause a problem? Because, because America said, Anybody in the world, come to America. We need workers here. And you'll go to Ellis Island, if you're coming in through New York, and just come on in. And these people had a bag, and that was all their possessions. They had two nickels to rub together. They didn't speak English. They didn't have an education. They were laborers, and they came to America. Why was that good then and not so good now? The difference is, those people came not for a handout, not for, hey, I'm going to get $2,000 a month from the government. I'm going to get a free cell phone. I'm going to get a place to live. I'm going to get my, uh, food. I'm going to get health insurance. I'm going to get medical care. No, those people knew that when they came to America, they were going to be given nothing. They knew when they hit Ellis Island and they went through all those turnstiles and the person said, stamp, you're now... In a, welcome to America. And the person lit up and cried and said, now I am in the land of opportunity. I left Germany or France or Italy or Ireland where we were starving because of the potato famine. And now I have nothing, not a nickel to my name. And I have to go and find a place where I can sleep. And maybe tonight I'll sleep in the park. Maybe I'll sleep in a room with nine other people which is what they did. And I will work. They didn't steal or rob. Yep, some of them did. We know that. But the majority said, I will work, because back then they had a sign. And it was different than the signs of people today that are on the street corners. The signs of people today, give me money. I don't have any. I'm a diabetic. It's always the same. I'm a diabetic. Give me money. You know what the sign was back then? will work for food. See the difference? When I see that guy up there holding up the sign, I roll down the window, he comes over. I go, hey, today's your lucky day. Are you hungry? Yes. Terrific. I have a job for you. And will you work for food? 
and he just, they don't even respond. They're disgusted with you for even suggesting that they have to work for money. They just, duh, and they just walk away. That's the difference. Quality of the person. So why are all these people allowed to just float in? How come the government doesn't stop it? By the way, it'd be really easy to stop. I didn't give you the simplest way in the world to stop any type of illegal immigration in any country in the world. It's super simple. You don't have to build the wall. You don't have to build the wall at all. You don't have to even have any agents at the border. It doesn't matter. All you have to do is tell everybody, hey, if you come to America and you're not here legally, no problem. But you just can't live because here's what's going to happen. Number one, if you go try to rent a car, the rental car agency says, I can't rent you a car unless you prove to me you're in the country legally. And if you can't do that by showing me a passport, a passport that's stamped that you're in the country legally or a U.S. passport, I can't rent you a car. Sorry. Next. And then if you go try to rent a, ho uh, a motel room, a motel room, Motel 6, Holiday Inn, hide like a room. Just like when I was in Switzerland. I walk into the Hyatt, hide like a room. Passport? What do you want to see my passport for? I have to make sure you're in the country legally. I go, what? Yeah, we can't rent you a hotel room unless you're in the country legally, unless you can prove that. What a simple system. So if a person in America can't rent a, a motel room, can't rent an apartment without proving they're in the country legally, oh, by the way, if you do rent that person, you go to prison, which is why uh, countries that have this, it works. And then if you go get a job, hi, I'd like to uh, have a job. No problem. Want to be a busboy? No problem. Want to wash dishes? No problem. Want to do landscaping? No problem. I need to see uh, your papers. I need to see you're in the country legally. And since you want a job, I also need to see your work permit. Oh, you don't have one because you're in the country illegally? I can't hire you because if I do, I go to jail. Next, please. And then if you walk into the DMV, hi, I'd like to get a driver's license. Sure, no problem. I need to see that you're in the country legally. If you're not, I can't give you a driver's license. Next, please. Then go to a bank. Hi, I'd like to open up a bank account. We'd love to open up a bank account for you. We want your business. Uh, papers, please. We need to see you're in the country legally. Oh, I don't have those because I'm in the country illegally. No habla. Sorry, can't open up a bank account. Next, please. Guess what would happen if that was implemented? 50 million people would leave America tomorrow. Now, that's not a good thing. Actually, that would actually be a catastrophe. I'm going to be a human catastrophe for the people that would have to do that. So it's a, it's a colossal problem. But why do politicians actually want? And by the way, not just, I know some of you out there are conservative Republicans, and some of you are liberal Democrats, and I love you all. I am neither. I am an independent arbiter of the facts who is a former insider. Why do liberal Democrats and conservative Republicans both desperately want millions and millions of illegal immigrants pouring into the United States? And this is the same, by the way, all over the world, no matter what country you live in. Here's the reason. The liberal Democrats want all these illegals to come in because they believe that they will vote ultimately for them. And if illegal immigrants come into America, they will have lots of children which generally is true. The uneducated have more kids than the college graduates. So the more uneducated that are coming in from spe specifically Latin American countries vote overwhelmingly more for liberal Democrats at all levels of government. So that's why liberal Democrats want them in. Get them in and let's try to get them citizenship or at least voting rights, and then we'll always be in power for the rest of eternity. There'll only be one party in America, liberal Democrat, party. So why do the stupid conservative Republicans want them in? Because they're short-term thinkers, not long-term like the liberal Democrats. The, the stupid conservative Republicans are very short-term thinkers, and they're thinking, all these businesses that donate to my campaign, they all hire illegal immigrants. 
Like every restaurant has illegal immigrants working there, right? Every landscaping company is full of illegal immigrants. Every food manufacturer, whether you're Tyson Food in Arkansas or whether you're uh, Driscoll Berries in California, if there's fields going on and they're out there picking, guess what? They're all illegally here. So these big companies that are pouring money to the Republican Party, as well as the independent Republican candidates are going, look, I'm going to give you a lot of money, but don't stop the illegals from coming in, for God's sakes. Who the hell is going to work in the fields and pick the berries? So that's why you have all these people pouring in. Ah. You know, do we have a, do we have uh, the phones are working now, right? We actually have the phones working. Uh, I, I'm going to do some movie reviews in a minute and some book reviews. I'm going to talk about testosterone and hypnosis and a bunch of other stuff. But let's go to the phone lines. Do we have a phone line? The phone line is uh, actually 855-927-1626. We're putting it up on the screen. If we have a caller, uh, uh, call in. Call on the line. Do we have uh, any callers on the line? We're just we're just putting the thing out. So if you want to give me a, if you have a question or a comment, then just give us a call and we'll put you on the air. If you have a question or a comment, just give us a call and we will put you on the air. I would love to hear from you. All right. So let me talk about my movie review segment of the show. Now, in the future, by the way, we actually are going to have segments like some some fun stuff here. But we're just starting the show. It's kind of brand new. By the way, we have a new microphone system. The last mic I was, last week we had sitting over here and every time I did this, came across. Is it still coming across when I do it? <laughs> But it's a boom mic, it's up there. So we got, we got a new mic, hopefully it sounds okay. All right, so I'm gonna give you a couple movie reviews to help you make a positive decision on what movies to see. And I will actually tell you which movies not to see as well. But today I'm just gonna give you a couple movies to see. First off, some uh, newer movies. There's three categories. There's like brand new movies, eh, kind of old, and then real old. So the brand new movie that it just came out in the last few months that is on Kevin Trudeau's recommended movie list is called, drumroll please. Oh, we don't have that set up yet, okay. That's our drum roll for now. I need to have a, I should have a guy here with a drum. The movie that I recommend, the new movie that I recommend that came out recently is called, now you don't laugh, it is a spectacular movie. It is called Godzilla Minus One Minus Color. Now pay attention, it's not, it's not the Hollywood version of Godzilla versus Kong. This was made in Japan. It is in Japanese with English subtitles. There are two versions. There's a colorized version, and there's one that's black and white. You want the black and white version. It's called Godzilla minus one minus color. There's no sex. There's no nudity. There's no, there's no swearing. The violence is not gruesome at all. You can watch every single scene and you don't see any limbs coming off or blood squirting out. It's not disgusting or, or anything like that. It, is, it has great acting by real, not movie stars, by, by real actors. It's got a story that's riveting. It's got dialogue that is engaging. It's got cinematography and, and visual scenes that look great. And yeah, there's a monster in it, Godzilla, but he doesn't look fake. It looks almost like it's believable to an extent. But you are brought into this world of fantasy, and it is a delightful story because I can't tell you. But you have to watch it. All I will say is that you will feel better at the end than when you started. So it's a lovely movie to watch, and I would highly encourage and recommend that you watch it. And if you do watch it, put a comment up in the comment section and, and let me know what you think about it. The second movie, which is a little older, uh, second movie, is called Kung Fu Panda. Kung Fu Panda. The original Kung Fu Panda. They just came out with the Kung Fu Panda 4. I have not seen it, so I can't comment on it. 
I can comment on three, no, two, no. Kung Fu Panda, the first one, yes. You watch Kung Fu Panda 1, and number one, it is entertaining. It is funny. There's no sex. There's no violence. There's no nudity. It's a cartoon. It is pure, lovely, clean entertainment that makes you feel good. But if you pay attention, there are life lessons. I actually did a seminar, I think a year and a half ago, two years ago. No, actually it was before, back in 19 or 2012. I did a seminar where I took like nine or 10 clips out of that movie. And I taught and showed that in your Wish Is Your Command and the Success Mastery course that I authored, and even the Science of Personal Mastery course, that the, what, I, what I'm teaching is actually embedded, the, those lessons are embedded in that movie Kung Fu Panda. So I would encourage you to watch Kung Fu Panda. And if you have not seen Kung Fu Panda in, in quite a while, by the way, do you have some callers coming in? Do you have some uh, calls? Okay. So we have, uh, is that the first one where it says host Q? Is that the first one or the first one? Okay, so I'll tell you what, what number here in a minute. We have some calls on the line. I'll be getting to you in just a moment. So Kung Fu Panda. And now the old movie, which is in, I don't know if it's in black and white. I think it originally was in black and white. Maybe it was colorized later. Both versions are okay if there is a black and white. I, I do remember seeing it in color. I'm not sure if I can recall seeing it in black and white, but it's lovely. It's called An Affair to Remember. Now, there was a remake. Throw that in the trash. The original. And I'm not sure if it's in the 50s or the early 60s. But the stars are Cary Grant. Some of you don't know who that is. He's a big movie star. He's a handsome guy. He's thin. This is back in the day when everybody was thin. Nobody was fat. Nobody was delusional. Cary Grant and the co-star is a beautiful redhead named Deborah Kerr, K-E-R-R, Deborah Kerr. The movie is funny. It has some wonderful dialogue. It's got a great storyline. You have to pay attention. It's actually a movie with acting. There is actually lines. It isn't Fast and Furious 9 with five words spoken in the, in the whole movie. Yeah. Let's do it. No, it's not that type of movie. This is, where, you know, some movies, the whole movie is just watching special effects and things blow up and people getting killed. This is, these are put on by the same actors and producers who say, we need to stop violence in America. We need to stop violence in America. Really? Why don't you stop making movies where everyone gets killed? You're, you're producing all this violence. You want to stop it? Stop the movies with the violence. So watch an affair to remember there's no violence. It is a charming movie. And the reason why I recommend it is not only do I love the movie and it's funny and it's pleasant and it's a feel-good movie at the end, and it has the flow where, you, where you're, you know, you're, oh, no, and then, yes, funny and lighthearted and it's just a beautiful movie. But it also teaches you a little bit about class. And the reason is when they go to dinner, see, remember I said this is a dinner jacket? When he goes to, when Cary Grant goes to dinner, I wish I looked like Cary Grant, but when Cary Grant goes to dinner, he's wearing a dinner jacket, which means a tuxedo. Because he's going to dinner and when Deborah Kerr goes to dinner, she's in a beautiful dress. And she has her hair done and makeup. And she has earrings and jewelry. And it's if you want to increase your quality of life and standard of living, start increasing your own class. You know, we used to go to the horse, horse track, and the horse would win. And we'd say, he's the class of the race. You should always, when you walk into a room, you should be the class of the room. Think about it. Raise your class. And it's more of a mental thing than anything. But start raising your class. But if you watch that movie, it is incredibly, incredibly fun. So we have some callers on the line here. All right, so let's go to, uh, let's go to caller from uh, Meredith from South Carolina. Is it caller nine? Let's go to caller nine. Meredith from South Carolina. We're going to take care of that call.
Hello, Meredith. This is Kevin Trudeau. You are live on the air. Oh, well, this is so exciting. First, let me say thank you so much for all of the work that you've done throughout the years. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you for thanking me. Yes, you've just done so many things that have changed my life. I remember back in 2005, my mom was bugging me so much to get your book, Natural Cure. She wouldn't stop going on about it. And so I finally did. And then I found your uh, radio show and it just changed my life. I mean, it opened my eyes to so many things and I'm very grateful to you. And I'm sure a lot of the uh, listeners are very grateful. And so I just want to ask you, um, in your opinion, what can we do to make the world a better place? What can we do to prevent the new world order? Very good. I'm going to answer your question. Uh, I'm going to hang up the phone, so pay attention. I'm going to answer it online for everybody as well. Okay, wonderful. Thank you. Thanks for calling. Bye-bye. By the way, for those of you who don't know what this is, this is called a telephone. And it actually is an old-fashioned phone. See, with my little, I can, I can dial. I know it's kind of funny, but I, I like answering the phone. But it's a great question. I think it's the number one question people always ask. We talk about and expose the New World Order or the global elitist plan or the global agenda, the globalist agenda, whatever you want to call it. And the question is, how do we change that? People have different opinions on this, but I'll give you mine. And it's just something you should think about and consider. Gandhi, I think, said it best. B the change you want to see in the world. What most people want to do is they want to change the environment. I would suggest don't worry about changing the environment. Change yourself first. Work on yourself first and your own life. By doing so, you put a ripple effect into the field, into the universal field. Things will change or improve as karma will allow. There are things that are happening on planet Earth that you and I, and there's no one that can stop or change. The Second World War, when that was, when, when that started, it's like you can't, you, you know, that, you can't put that cat back in the barn. It's like, it's gone. Once that door is open and you let that out, you know, the cat's out of the bag, the cat's already out of the bag, you can't put them back in. Once it went into effect, you can't stop it. It has to play itself out. The globalist agenda, the next 50 years, it's pretty much going to play itself out. There's really nothing we can do. This is why the serenity prayer is so powerful. God, please grant me the courage to change the things I can change, the patience to accept the things I can't, and the wisdom to know the difference. Most people are always trying to change things that they can't change. And so they don't have that wisdom to understand that they can't. They have to have the patience or the understanding to accept it. And then the other serenity prayer is, God, grant me to courage to change the people I can change, the patience to accept the people I can't change, and the courage to know the only person I can change is me. The only person you can change is yourself. You can't change anyone else and you can't change the environment. If you work on yourself, you, your energy then affects everything else around you. It makes the everything different, which is why Everything that I'm promoting here is trying to get you to work on yourself and look within and stop judging what's around. Be aware of it, but be aware as an observer and as the witness to it without judgment, criticism, or without getting all uptight about it. Relax a little bit. Look, I wrote the book Natural Cures. One of the things I say in there is you may want to stay away from high fructose corn syrup or monosodium glutamate because they're neurotoxins. They screw up the brain. They uh, reduce your libido. They reduce your testosterone. They cause all types of problems. So I'm sitting down with a friend of mine, and he has a cupboard full of Doritos 
which are loaded with both high fructose corn syrup, genetically modified corn from Monsanto, and monosodium glutamate. And he sits there and he opens up the bag and you want some? No, the, no, not, no thanks. I don't try to tell him, what are you doing? Because it's his life. I mean, I care, but not that much. I just politely say, thanks for asking, because it was very polite for him to ask if I wanted a bag of Doritos too. He didn't ask me if I wanted a few. He had a bag, a big bag. You want a bag? <laughs> he wasn't gonna get a, give me any of his because he was gonna eat the whole bag, which he did. He asked me if I wanted a bag. That's very polite. So I say, thank you for asking and being so polite, but no, not for me. I don't bring up anything about monosodium glutamate. I don't go, oh, I'm not judging him. I'm living my own life. He's living his own life. No problem. I hope that answers your question. I'm going to go to the phone here in a minute, but I got, I got something else I got to tell you. Because we're running out of time, as usual. Somebody already said to me, I mean, they did one show already, and they're saying, are you going to do these every day? God, help me. This is a lot of work. Maybe. I don't want to. Yes, I do. No, I really don't. I was sitting here getting my makeup done, uh, and I said, you know, I was supposed to be retired. I've been telling everybody I'm retired. And they said, how can you be retired? Every time I see you, you say you're working. I don't know. All right. Uh, so I gave you my three movie recommendations now. I'm no longer a former insider. Who am I right now? Here we go. I am now guru. So as a guru, I am going to recommend, which means you have to do it. I mean, if you're going to a guru, you have to do what the guru says. Otherwise, don't bother to go see the guru. Guru knows all. So I, I now know all because I am the guru as well as... Okay. Uh, by the way, it's one of my relatives back there. Someone says it looks like me. It's a, I have some Japanese blood in me. It's a distant relative that someone says looks like me. I don't know. I don't, think, I don't see any resemblance at all. I don't even know if it's really a relative. But here's the book that I recommend as guru. Do you want your life to be better? Say yes. Okay. Do you want to make more money? Yes. Uh, do you want to be happier? Do you want to have less stress? Um, do you want to feel more fulfilled? Do you want more people to like you? Oh, I'll give you one last one. How many people watching would like to all of a sudden become super lucky? Like super lucky, like everything goes their way. I have an answer, and the answer is a very small little book, which is very inexpensive to buy. And it's called Karmic Management. This is the book, Karmic Management. You see that? Okay. So Karmic Management is the, is the book. And it says what goes around comes around in your business and in your life. Karmic Management. Let's face it, life is one long string of jobs. We need a way to get them done right. We need a surefire receipt, recipe, I'm sorry, for success. Financial success, sure. That's what we're talking about. But at the same time, you want to be a success as a person, a good person, a truly happy person, a person who's mentally and physically healthy. And if we're doing things right, we also help all the people around us, the world too, all at the same time. This little book gives you a completely new way of getting tasks and projects done. It's not something you've ever heard of before, but it works, and it always works. Give it a try. This is the book. It is spectacular. It talks about how karma, how the law of attraction actually can be implemented in real-life situations, both at work and at home. It is super practical. It is super easy to read. It is big print, big print. It's easy to read, it's a fast read, it's spectacular. It's required reading, by the way, for all of my staff. And we as a company utilize these principles and techniques. I've talked about it in the giving lessons that I give away for free as part of the Guru Kev lessons. It's also available at the kevintrudeaufanclub.com website. But this book I highly recommend. And I also recommend that if you go to kevintrudeaufanclub.com, we have free of charge 
my recommended reading list. If you want all my recommended books, they're right there. Just go to kevintrudeaufanclub.com. You get the recommended reading list. But this is a, a spectacular book that I highly endorse and recommend. Do we have a, another caller? All right, you, you pick a caller. Uh, how about Jason from Texas? Let's go to Jason from Texas. We got a lot of people on the line here. I'm going to get to you all. And there's the phone. And I'm going to answer the phone. Hello, Jason from Texas. Kevin Trudeau here. You are live on the air. Hello, Kevin. Nice to meet you. I just have a quick question. Like, what do you think about President Donald J. Trump? And, like, do you think he's going to be good for America or bad for America? Or, you know, like, what's your thoughts about him? Good. Thanks for the uh, question. Uh, I'm going to hang up and I'll be answering it right for everybody as well. Okay. Okay. Thank you so much. Thanks for calling. All right. This is a great question. Now, our show is not political. We're not right, left. The question is. If Donald Trump becomes president, is he going to be good for America, bad for America? Is he going to be better for America than somebody else who's becomes president? Okay, so here's how it works. The president of the United States has some power, but not so much. Congress has some, and then, of course, the judiciary, 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 judiciary. The judicial branch, we use that word. The judges, you know, the courts, they have some power as well. Interestingly enough, our government has done something that's pretty amazing. When you, when you think we went to war, we, we declared war against uh, Japan and Italy and Germany, the Axis powers, back in 1940. Do you remember the date? December 7th, 1941, it was right after that, that America declared war. And actually, the president does not declare war. In order for America to send troops and shoot at other citizens of other countries, in order for America to actually shoot its military, to shoot at, at citizens of other countries, we, we legally in our Constitution, can only do that if Congress, Congress votes and declares war against that country. This is how America could then send troops over and shoot Germans and shoot Italians and shoot Japanese. So it's really great to know that since then, America has not declared war against anybody. And I think it's wonderful to see that America has not sent troops to shoot at anybody else in any country anywhere in the world since 1945. Wait a minute. Didn't we send troops into Vietnam and shoot Vietnamese? Well, how could that happen when we didn't declare war against Vietnam? Oh, didn't we send troops over in Iraq and kill Iraqis? How could that happen? It was a full-blown war in Iraq, but we did not declare war against Iraq. How is this possible? How do we send drones all around the world and blow up buildings and kill people and assassinate people all over the world since 1945 without declaring war? Here's the point. The point is politicians really don't have a lot to say with what goes on. They're pretty much susceptible to the influence of others primarily uh, the Society of the Brotherhood, and they're controlled. We have one party in Washington, and that's called politician. Trump originally wasn't a politician, and if you know the story, as I do, and I've been on a plane with him and so forth, when he first wanted to become president, it wasn't he'd wanted to become president. He was just wanted to get publicity for his apprenticeship. He didn't think he was going to become president. That's why he had no cabinet picked out. When he was winning, it was like, whoa. Do you realize when he became president and walked into the White House, he said, where is everybody? Where's the receptionist? Where's the secretaries? And they said, "Uh, Mr. President, you have to hire all those people. He goes, you mean there's nobody here? He didn't even know that he had to put together an entire staff at the White House. He thought he'd walk in, everybody would be lining up going, hi, we're here to serve you. You know, I'm the cook. No, the cook gets fired as soon as the old president leaves. 
Trump has to bring in his own cook. So he didn't know what was happening. So if, if Biden becomes president, if Hillary Clinton becomes president, if uh, Kamala Harris becomes president, if Nikki Haley becomes president, if Trump becomes president, are things really going to change? Sure, there's going to be some policy changes. There's going to be a little tax change. That's changing all the time. At the end of the day, you can live an amazing, spectacular life in the United States of America, regardless of what party is in power, regardless of what the tax code is, regardless of what the regulations are, regardless of what the laws state, who's president, who's in Congress, who's the Speaker of the House. All those things are external forces which should have no impact or effect on your life whatsoever if you are a cause over your environment. So think about that. Now, I will say this about, about, about Donald Trump. I think Donald Trump's situation, specifically with, the, with all the lawsuits. Now, when I said it for me, you know, that's, I'm, who am I? But I know particularly the political family that put the Federal Trade Commission after me to try to shut me up. I know for a fact I was there because I was given the deal, the option of taking the money and walking away and you never would have heard from me ever again and not being attacked or being attacked. Government, and by the way, this is something that you don't have to believe or disagree or, or, uh, or, or disbelieve or think it might be true or it isn't. Not only do the facts overwhelmingly back up what I'm about to say, but you hear President Nixon say it on the Nixon tapes. And it goes back in the records from writings and letters from all the way to Abraham Lincoln and all the way to, to President George Washington. Everyone has done this, and that is this. Whoever, in, in America and all over the world, in other countries, it's more blatant. America, it's becoming more blatant. And that is this. Whoever is in political power, they use the Department of Justice and they use all the other agencies to go after political enemies. That's a fact. So whoever is in power, you hear President Nixon talking about some of his political enemies on the Nixon tapes. And I will paraphrase, but this is the exact tape. I'm going to paraphrase. Nixon says he's got his chief of staff there. So it's not like a secret meeting. He's got, the, he's got all the cabinet members there. And they're talking about their political enemies because even though they're supposed to be running the country, they spend half of their time running for re-election. So that's another thing with the whoever you whoever is president, they, they spend half of their time running for re-election, not even doing their job. Because their job is to stay in power so they can enjoy all the perks. It's really a big scam. But anyway, so so Nixon is there with his cabinet. And the Nixon tapes go something like this. They're talking about their political enemies. So we got a few people here that we really need to, you know, that are causing us some problems, Mr. President, that we really should, you know, try to silence. And Nixon says, well, what agency should we go, uh, should we put on that guy? Should, we always use the IRS. Is there another agency? And he goes, well, we could use the EPA. Because in his particular instance, I think the Environmental Protection Agency could really go after him and you know, they can bury him. Good. Get the EPA after him. How about the next guy? Oh, FDA. Oh, good. Put the FDA after him. Oh, this guy's got some potential issues. If we put the DOJ after him, the FBI, I bet you we can get an indictment easy. And that's when the phrase, good. Heck, you can indict a ham sandwich, of course. Use, use the FBI after him, which means you can indict anybody. And it goes back to the phrase which says, show me the man and I'll show you the crime, which means I'm the FBI. Give me a guy's name, I'll have him indicted. Anybody in the United States, that's the FBI. FBI said, give me the name. You can pull it out of a hat. Any person in America, I will get them indicted because we have hundreds of thousands of laws and regulations, which are all crimes, I can charge him with something. All I have to do is investigate the guy. I'll come up with something. I'll present it to the grand jury. He'll be indicted. That means he has to defend himself. He'll basically, rather than face years in prison, will plead guilty and I get a conviction. That's how the system works. So Trump, 
Trump obviously is a political outsider to some extent, and both Republicans and Democrats hate him because he's upsetting the apple cart. Is he the smartest guy in the world? Look, look, you could argue this all day long about, you know, is he dumb like a fox? There was an old, there was an old uh, movie with, um, called The Pink Panther with Peter Sellers. And there was a series of them. One was called The Pink Panther. The second one was A Shot in the Dark. Next one is The Revenge of the Pink Panther, The Return of the Pink Panther. The Pink Panther Strikes Again. And Inspector Clouseau is a bumbling buffoon. He's not smart. He's an idiot. He's a bumbling idiot. He's just an idiot, okay? He's not smart. He's an idiot. And in one particular scene, but he always kind of like trips over the criminal by accident and winds up, you know, solving the case and capturing the bad guy. But it's not through anything of his own. It's it's just like a miracle that it, that it works out that way. And this one particular scene, they want to eliminate Clouseau. So they want to assassinate him. And there's a bunch of businessmen are sitting around a table. And he says, you know, I don't know why we need to go after him. He's really just a bumbling buffoon. He's actually an idiot. And the other guy says, I have it on good authority that he only acts like the fool. It is only an act. And so when you're dealing with Trump and he says some dumb things, I remember he was being interviewed. He didn't know what Aleppo was. It is not a thing. It's a place where things were happening. It was, a, it was in the news a lot in, uh, in Syria. Heck, I, I, I don't know much about it, but he's running for president. He's supposed to be briefed and all this stuff. He's being interviewed. And they said, what do you think of Aleppo? And he goes, who's that? No, no, Aleppo's a city. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, tell me, what, what do you think about it? Because he didn't, ha he didn't even know where, that it was a city. All right. But at the end of the day, we see that Trump is being attacked. And you can argue, hey, he did commit fraud in New York. He did commit this. He did commit that. That's why he's being charged. Well, how many times... Is somebody charged with a crime and somebody else who's done the exact same thing is not charged with a crime? Let's take Hillary Clinton. Hillary Clinton got a subpoena, a subpoena, and the subpoena says, turn over your emails. The next day, she takes her email server and has it wiped clean by getting what's called acid, acid washed which is the deepest level of scrubbing you can do. Not just deleted emails, had it acid washed and then submitted it. And they said, you destroyed evidence. You got a subpoena. You, it's a criminal act if the subpoena says turn over your emails and if you delete them. If the, if the, if the, if the act says turn over your, t your cell phone and then you had it crushed the day after, you would go to jail because you violated the, the subpoena request knowingly. She clearly knowingly did that. There's no question about that. And I'm not judging her, I'm just pointing out the facts. Nobody charged her. So we see what's called selective prosecution and it happens all the time. Now, why is this helpful to you? It means just calm down. Stop reading the newspapers because who cares? We just know, look, they're going after this person, but you read the news and you say, ah, he, he committed fraud. And then they go, well, the judge found him guilty. Okay, how many times has, an, has a judge or jury found somebody guilty and then the person gets that conviction overturned in appeal? I don't know the percentage, but it happens. But I will tell you something that I do know. How many people are in prison who are absolutely 100% innocent. And I would argue this 30 to 40% of people in both state and federal prisons in America, maybe more around the world, that are absolutely 100% innocent, even though they're in prison. How do we know this? Just look at the number of innocent people are being pulled out of prison after 10, 20, 30 years who were convicted of murder because of new DNA evidence proving, proving 
that they were 100% innocent all along. There are innocent people found guilty all the time. And, and we just, we just, we just kind of know, no. We just kind of know that to be true. All right, let's go, let's go back to the uh, phone lines here. Uh, let's go to the, uh, Roman from New York, number 17. Roman from New York. Got a ton of callers here. It's like Roman from New York. Roman, Kevin Trudeau here. Yes, hi. You're live on the air. Thank you, Kevin. Mr. Kevin Trudeau, I just want to say personally express my gratitude because everything you're saying from being an immigrant and I was lucky enough to come to this country with my parents legally and going through college and with the loans and everything, um, I was able to become a pharmacist. However, over the years, I was unfortunately exposed to things that um, made my mind don't think in a very uh, expandable way. And thank you to you, your club, Kevin Trudeau Fan Club, Global Information Network, and uh, meeting you in person multiple times have demonstrated my abilities within. And I just want to say thank you to you because it has changed my life emotionally, physically, financially, and all of the above again and again and again. Well, Roman, I appreciate the, the comments and uh, I, I know you. When I saw your name, I didn't even uh, think that it was R Roman from here. I, everybody, this fellow was at my house and he's a spectacular cook. He got me a set of Carico cookware. He's a distributor for Carico cookware. They call, they're part of, the, of a group called the Wellness Brothers. And he cooked a spectacular meal with, uh, with, with uh, Nathan and Ruben that were at my house. And it was off the chart. So if you're ever looking for great cookware, you reach out to Roman, by the way, uh, in New York. Roman, I'm going to let you go. But thanks so much for calling in the comments. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. Take care. Have a great day. Bye-bye. Right. Bye. I didn't know that was Roman. I'm thinking that it's Roman. Uh, all right, we're running out of time. Testosterone. Oh. All right, so next show I'm going to talk about testosterone, fellas. Uh, <laughs> all right, you want you you don't, how, listen. I'm going to embarrass everybody, but nobody's here to be embarrassed. Many, 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 many people in America use Viagra or Cialis or some type of ED erectile dysfunction medication because they can't get hard. And it's unfortunate that a lot of guys in their 30s and 40s, even 20s, are having this problem. Uh, it's not so much prevalent around the world, just like antidepressants are utilized in America, but not so much around the world. We consume more antidepressants than the rest of the world combined. We, we consume more ED medication than the rest of the, of, of the world combined. So I'm gonna tell you next week how you can increase your testosterone natu naturally and what's causing you to have low T or low testosterone. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you the, the natural cure next week. So make sure you pay attention to that. I'm gonna talk about hypnosis, but I wanna talk about one more thing here before I go. And that is I am doing an event coming up in April in Orlando, Florida. It's a three day event, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. Tickets are $2,500, and I want to give you a free ticket. Now, it's a free, 100% free, $2,500 ticket. We have a formal banquet, formal means black tie. Saturday night, you have to buy a ticket for that, for the meal. But the whole seminar is free, and I'm going to give you a ticket for free if you want to come. But if you can't physically come, because a lot of you are watching from all over the world, say, I can't get the time off from work. It's too expensive for me to get the hotel room and the airfare. We are broadcasting it virtually, and those tickets are $1,000. I will give you a free virtual ticket or a free live in-person ticket. And if you come, I'll, I'll take a picture with you as well. How do you get your free ticket? The event's almost sold out. All you have to do is become an associate member in the Global Information Network. It's 38 bucks. That's it. So you can become an associate member. It's the $38, and then it's $18.95 a month. And you can go to the event, and if you don't like the club, quit. So it didn't cost you much. But you also get your wishes, your command. You get a private one-on-one -on -one personal success coach uh, that, can, that can help you, a member support coach that can help you. You get the video 10 steps to manifesting your goals and dreams. You get some whole bunch of, of material for that cost, you get access to a lot of things as a member of the club. You can kind of taste the club. So 
if you'd like to meet me, if you'd like a photo with me, if you want to meet me in person, if you want to, and I'll tell you, this event, it's called Dream Weekend. I have a guy coming in there who's going to be speaking on Saturday night at the banquet. Good friend of mine that I was with in prison. He was in prison for eight or nine or 10 years. Now think about this. He was convicted for fraud, he had some financial problems, made, made mistakes, took responsibility, had a big restitution, came out. But while he was there, he participated in my training course that I offered inmates called Your Wish is Your Command, How to Manifest Your Desires. I taught that live. I taught it every Tuesday night in the visiting room. We had over 600 inmates come in for like nine weeks in a row. He went through that. We became friends. He was also someone who wanted to learn how to write, and I suggested copywriting, and I taught him how to write copy. He came out, to make a long story short, he started writing copy for people using the techniques I taught him, and he made, I think, over six or seven million dollars since he's been out of prison. He's an equity uh, holder in a uh, two or three hundred million dollar a year company. Just had dinner at Jack Nicholas's house, the golfer. He's going to be telling his story. And just to hear him talk about how he made so much money with what I taught him is, is worth the trip. Or if you can't physically be there to do it virtually. So go to Global Information Network. Maybe we can put that up on the screen. Globalinformationnetwork.com. Sign up and become an associate member. It's all you have to do is be an associate member and you'll get a free ticket. Your member support coach will call you in a couple of days, tell you how to register for the live event. Or if you can't go live, register for the virtual event. It's free, no charge. You just have to buy a ticket to the banquet dinner on Saturday night if you go there live. And it is formal, uh, ladies and gentlemen. So if you're a gal, gowns, it's a beautiful dinner. And if you're a gentleman, tuxedo, it is, it's a formal uh, uh, dinner on Saturday night. The rest of the event is not formal, but generally people wear, uh, dress in suits and ties or they dress nice because we class the place up because we're a classy organization. There'll be people there from all over the world, probably 100 countries could be represented, members from all over the world. You'll probably meet some celebrities and it'll be a great time. It's a $2,500 ticket, absolutely free, so take advantage of that. And lastly, I have booked an entire cruise ship. We booked the Norwegian Cruise Line Pearl the entire ship. We own the entire ship for one whole week coming up in January 2026. It's a one-week cruise. It's absolutely free. You don't have to pay a penny. All you have to do is become a level one member in the Global Information Network. You have to be a what's called an economic zone one. You have to be in economic zone one. That's where you live. And you have to become a level one member. It's almost half sold out already. But if you become a level one member in the Global Information Network, you get a free, no strings attached, free ticket on that cruise. I'm doing all the training on that cruise. Now, it's not going to be just training, but there's going to be 2,500 Global Information Network members on that cruise from all around the world. There'll be celebrities. There'll be successful people, millionaires, multimillionaires. There may be some billionaires. Some of the uh, council members could be on that cruise. It's going to be fun and spectacular. All the food's paid for, everything when you're on a cruise ship. It's all expense paid. I'm going to be giving some special training. It's going to be a spectacular, spectacular time. You will not want to miss that. It's a one-of-a-kind event. The tickets for that are $7,500. You get to go absolutely free just by becoming a member in the Global Information Network Level 1 and you have to live in a economic zone, one country. So check that out. Go to globalinformationnetwork.com and check that out. Uh, we are out of time for this week. I, I have to go to my formal event. But next week, we have a lot more stuff, and I will be taking a lot more phone calls. And I can already see, because the phone lines here are just written off the charts. Uh, the people that want to talk, and I'm looking at here, arthritis, uh, where to get good flour to bake, what do I do uh, to keep my teeth cleaned, uh, how does being an amputee affect body? There's so many questions. Uh, so a lot's going to happen here. Make sure you like this. Share it with everyone you know. Get more people to subscribe. We're going to uh, end the show right now and run the partner high-level donors. I appreciate you so very, very much. If you're not a partner in the fan club, please consider becoming a partner. 
Uh, for those who were partners and took advantage of my Bitcoin thing a year ago, you're rich today. I mean, it really is that, that simple. I mean, I, I gave you the, I, listen, I, when I'm talking to billionaires in, in Dubai and I'm sharing that information with you, if you're too stupid to take advantage of it because you're looking for what? I don't know what. What are you looking for? You think you're going to get rich in 10 seconds? It's, it takes months, consistent and persistent. Successful people do the right things long enough consistently. So pay attention. But don't worry, it's not the last opportunity. If you're partnering with me and you're getting my emails and you're listening to the stuff on the Telegram channel, I'm giving you all the information. If you're a member of Jen, you, you get the information. Level five and above members, they get all, they get all the stuff. Hey, I'm, I'm sharing you everything. And the best is yet to come. I'm Kevin Trudeau. You're watching The Kevin Trudeau Show, everything they don't want you to know about. Thanks for tuning in, and we'll see you next week. Remember, you can do it.